Within modern Christianity, there seem to be two distinct methods for reading the Bible, which, at the extremes, create two distinct views within modern Christianity. The first is the more literalist view favored by creationists and evangelicals, while the second is a more interpretive, non-literal view favored by more moderate Christians. Now, personally, I would prefer to live in a society dominated by the more interpretive Christians, who generally try to work around the parts of the Bible that don't fit our modern sensibilities. On a practical level, I do appreciate these people very much. But, when it comes time to discuss Christianity itself, I can't help but respect the more literalist Christians for, you might say, owning up to what their book actually says, rather than simply hand-waving it away as, for example, figurative language. Now, I grant, of course, that the Bible does have a lot of figurative language, but, well, frankly, this does not give us creative license to say that everything is hyperbole and metaphor. Now, of course, in principle, you could interpret anything to mean anything, but in practice, there has to be a realistic limit to the flexibility of a given text. As just one example, if you personally believe that Hitler was actually a nice guy, for some reason, you could conceivably interpret Mein Kampf to be about peace and love. And you know what? You might just be able to construct a coherent interpretation to that end. But, even if your interpretation is not patently illogical, most people would point out that this is just not an honest reading of the text. Practically speaking, saying that Mein Kampf is about peace and love is just a failure of critical reading skills. Likewise, when it comes to the Bible, I often see this same type of creative interpretation. Very often, moderate Christians will choose to label certain passages as figurative language, not based on what the text actually says, or on what the author most likely believed as he wrote the text, but on what they, the modern Christian, already believe about the world and about Christianity. And this is my key point for this video. You cannot determine whether a particular passage is literal or figurative based on your modern knowledge or your personal beliefs. Your analysis must be based on the knowledge and beliefs of the author, as best we can determine them, and on what the author actually wrote down. To do otherwise will lead to interpretations that almost certainly were not what the author meant. A great example of this type of behavior comes from the YouTuber Inspiring Philosophy in his videos on the Genesis story of Noah's Flood. IP believes that the Flood literally happened at some point in history, but he believes that it was only a local Flood that wiped out a specific region. This region, he says, only had wicked people in it, who were more violent than any other group of people in history. As a result, no children were there, and no righteous people were there, so it was only these violent, wicked adults who God killed. All the stuff about the Flood being global and killing everyone, he argues, is just hyperbolic language, which means that God didn't commit global genocide after all. What a relief. To support his conclusion, he first cites other examples of hyperbole in Genesis to show that the book is full of hyperbole, and therefore, the Flood doesn't have to be such an extreme literal event. So Genesis contains several verses that contain hyperbole and exaggeration, and that might be all that is happening in the Flood story. However, many of his examples of hyperbole, along with his analysis of the Flood account itself, are clearly not based on what the text actually says or what its authors probably believed, but rather on what he himself already believes as a 21st century science-believing Christian. So let's go through some of the passages that IP identifies as hyperbole, and then let's take a look at his account of the Flood. Genesis 8-2 says the windows of the heavens were closed. But even global Flood proponents realize they are not literal windows in the sky. IP says that the firmament and its windows are obviously figurative language. But... why? His only justification is that practically no modern Christians believe this passage to be literal. But this passage was not written by modern Christians. It was written by ancient Jews, and ancient Jews did seem to believe that the firmament physically existed as a dome above the land, and that its purpose was to create a pocket of air within the waters, what we now call outer space, where God's creatures could live. 
This is what Genesis seems to be describing in the creation story. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Thus God made the firmament, and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. Indeed, in the NRSV translation, the word firmament is translated as dome. The only reason why modern Christians glean a different meaning from these passages, claiming them to be figurative rather than literal, is because they already know that these passages are factually wrong. Outer space is not full of water, and the sky is not a solid barrier holding it back. Saying that the firmament and its windows are figurative language is simply not an honest reading of what the authors actually wrote. It's a transparent attempt to rescue a faulty text. In Genesis 41, it says, All the earth came to buy grain from Joseph. But obviously the Chinese, Australians, or Mesoamericans didn't travel to Egypt to buy grain. Nor did Jacob. He just sent his sons to buy grain. So this is obviously hyperbole. Okay, but the author didn't know about Australia or the Americas. From the author's perspective, it would have been entirely possible for people from every region on Earth to come to Egypt. IP is labeling this passage as hyperbole, not because the author knew about Australia and the Americas, but because he knows about Australia and the Americas. Once again, this is just not an honest way to read an ancient document. In Genesis 14, it says the enemies took all the possessions of Sodom. So even the clothes in the houses? This is obviously hyperbole to mean Sodom was ransacked, but they probably literally didn't carry everything out of Sodom and leave all the people bare naked. In my opinion, this passage probably is hyperbolic, but not because I know that this is not how cities are ransacked, but because the author would have known that this is not how cities are ransacked. It's probably never been the case that cities were literally picked clean of every last item, and the author would have been in a position to know this. Once again, the litmus test for figurative language has to be what the author probably knew and believed, not what modern people know and believe. Alright, so now that we've looked at some examples of figurative language, or not-so-figurative language, I think we can move on to the Flood. And first, I'd like to do a quick check of your critical reading skills. That is, you, the audience. I'm going to read a few passages, and I'd like you to tell me what this God or Lord character wants to do, and ultimately does. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt, for all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, The end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. And behold, I myself am bringing floodwaters on the earth, to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. And all flesh died that moved on the earth, birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of the spirit of life, all that was on the dry land, died. So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Now, critical reading check. What does God want to do? Does he want to A. Wipe out every land animal on earth, including humans. B. Wipe out every human on earth, but none of the animals. C. Wipe out every adult human in a small geographic region. Or D. Wipe out a short list of specific humans. The answer, of course, is A. God wants to wipe out every land animal on Earth, including humans. 
This is clearly what the story is about. Furthermore, the repetition of this desire seems to hammer home the notion that this was, in fact, a global event. If the author had said it just once, then you might be able to say that it was hyperbolic. But when the author repeatedly says that God wanted to destroy man and beast, make an end to all flesh, destroy them along with the earth, everything on earth shall die, it's kind of hard to escape the conclusion that the author really did mean a global event. If you don't think that this is what the author meant, well, what else could he have said if he wanted to describe a global event? If that is what he meant, could he have been any more clear about it? Your devotion to scholarship is a shining beacon to all who... Stop it! I cheated! Cheated, 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 cheated! Lisa, what are you trying to say? I cheated! <laughs> So it seems fairly clear that this story is describing a global flood that wiped out all terrestrial animals on Earth, including humans, except, of course, for those on the Ark, which the story specifically exempts. Again, critical reading skills. All creatures with the breath of life, except those on the Ark. Inspiring philosophy, however, disagrees. He believes that this was a local flood, and that the only humans who died in it were adults. Adults who, he says, were engaged in such extreme violence that there was not a single child in the region at the time. In defense of these ideas, Inspiring Philosophy makes the following arguments. Now, please do note, this is not his complete argument set, but these particular arguments rest on the kind of flawed reading style that I'm here to critique. The event carries theological and moral issues for many. Why would God literally drown everyone, even the children and infants? But did he? This is often assumed as an indirect consequence of a flood, but let's remember this is an assumption not mentioned in the text. It is possible there were no children that died in the flood. This might sound implausible on the surface, but nevertheless it very well could have been the case. Let's remember textually and geologically there is no reason to suggest the flood was global, but only regional within the area of modern day Iraq and eastern Arabia. That limits the scope of the damage it could have done. But also remember, the flood was sent because of violence that was on the face of the land. And the biblical text treats the time of Noah as an anomaly, unlike anything the world has since seen. It is best compared to a later event in Genesis, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham asked God to spare the cities of the plain, if there is just 10 righteous people inside, and God agrees. But such a thing was not found, and thus Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. Now combine that with how scripture implies there is an age of accountability, implying that people have to have the ability to consciously do evil, which many children are incapable of. Therefore, it is likely God destroyed Sodom because there literally was no one innocent or righteous within these cities. Likewise, the flood is set up as a special circumstance that doesn't happen all the time. The people were so violent, there was literally no innocent life left. Children were likely victims, or family-oriented people would have fled the region or have been victims themselves. I certainly applaud Inspiring Philosophy's creativity, but I think it's clear that this is not an honest reading of the Flood account. Now, that's not to say that his interpretation is an impossible reading of the text, but his idea that the Flood only killed violent adults in a specific region is simply not what the story itself indicates. Now, he may believe this for other reasons, such as his belief that God does not do evil things, or that children are innocent, and his knowledge that the world was never completely flooded, but the text of Genesis tells a completely different story. In the comments section of his video, I pushed back on his conclusion that there were no children present, and in response, he asked me, what verse says children drowned? Oh, I don't know. What verse says that the flood killed any women? Or that it killed anyone with brown eyes? Would you believe that no brown-eyed women died in the Genesis flood? Especially if the person proposing this idea was pre-committed to the notion that God wouldn't kill brown-eyed women for some reason? Of course not, because that would not be an honest reading of what the story actually says. The story says that all flesh died. Frankly, it seems to me that modern Christians, like Inspiring Philosophy, are not reading the text to understand what the author meant, but rather to reshape the text around their own beliefs. 
specifically their belief that the loving God they worship is the same being as the God of the Old Testament, their belief that there was no global flood, which of course I agree with, but I take this as evidence that the Bible is just wrong, and their belief that God wouldn't kill children. Except for all the children God killed in other places, but that's not the point. The only reason it even occurs to modern Christians to reinterpret passages like these is because they already know that these passages are wrong, or because the passages reflect a different theology from their own. So instead of either conceding that the original author was mistaken, or conceding that this genocidal being is not the god they worship, they attempt to salvage the text by making room for modern knowledge and modern theology. God doesn't need to save them, they need to save God.